Greetings comrades, we have a new series on this channel. Let's call it Letters from our viewers. Today we have a letter from Timmy. So Timmy is asking, hey Mr. Sitako, can you please explain, why did the Soviet Union collapse? Ah, uh, you see Timmy, it's simply because communism is great on paper, but just doesn't work in real life. And well, that's it. Thanks for watching, smash that like button. Okay, alright. Let's try to find some reasons for the collapse of the Soviet Union and most importantly try to understand why it was inevitable. First of all, I want to remind you that I'm just a regular guy on YouTube. My opinion is just that, my personal opinion, not the ultimate truth. I just research the topic and offer you my take on it. There are actual historians that write dozens of books discussing the collapse of the USSR. Obviously, it is hard to explain this whole topic in a 10-minute YouTube video. But I'm still going to give you 10 reasons why I think it was inevitable in the end. The reasons are also not sorted by their importance. After all, it was the sum of them that broke the spine of the Soviet Union. Oh, and before we start, I just wanted to say that my channel now has a Discord server. It is kinda new, but if you want to chat with me or other viewers of the channel, the link is in the description below. First, let's ask ourselves, were there any warning signs in the 70s? Something that foreshadowed such a rapid collapse of the USSR. If you ask the people who lived in the Soviet Union back then, they will tell you no. An ordinary Soviet person in the 1980s could not even imagine that in just 10 years the mighty communist regime would fall. And it's not even because people believed in the bright future of communism. It was because of one man, basically, Leonid Brezhnev. During his nearly 20 years of reign, he had accustomed people of the USSR to the fact that nothing can ever change. In fact, the period of stagnation lasted in the USSR for 23 years, from Brezhnev's rise to power to the sweeping reforms of 87. Brezhnev himself spoke about it in private conversations like this. Oh, come on, reforms? I am afraid to even sneeze loudly. God forbid, one rock will roll and an avalanche will follow. Economic freedoms will lead to chaos. Things will start to happen. They'll just cut each other up. For 23 years, an entire generation of people lived like it was a Groundhog Day. That is why people did not believe that anything could happen in the Soviet Union at all. Neither bad, nor good. And that's why some people considered this period to be stagnation, while others considered it the real golden era of the Soviet Union. So for the latter, of course, it is easy to blame everything on Mikhail Gorbachev. They just say that a bold fraud came along and ruined everything that had been working for 23 years. But this is not true. The problems in the Soviet Union started long before Gorbachev came to power and for a long time they were ignored, accumulating like a snowball. Gorbachev only tried to solve them all at once. This is why the collapse of the USSR happened so fast. If Gorbachev had not changed anything or had solved these problems one by one, the USSR could have probably lasted for another couple of decades but the outcome would still have been the same. But let's not remove all the responsibility from Mikhail Sergeyevich. Although I believe that the collapse of the USSR was only a matter of time, he still had a theoretical chance of preventing it. Yes, the Soviet Union would have shrunk in size anyway. I think that even the most ardent supporters of communism won't deny that Baltic countries wanted to live separately. But the other countries might well have remained part of the USSR. In fact, Gorbachev had two ways to preserve the Soviet Union. The way of Deng Xiaoping and the way of gradually abandoning communism and the one-party system. The way of Deng Xiaoping worked perfectly for China, but there is one fundamental difference. China in the 70s was an 80% agrarian country. The USSR in the 80s was 80% industrial. Xiaoping style reforms would simply not have had such a gigantic effect on the USSR. Plus, Xiaoping had precisely a gradual plan of reforms, which began with the agrarian complex and then affected other areas of life after the success of the first stage. Moreover, all of his reforms were economic, not political in nature. Gorbachev, on the other hand, decided to go at it from the other end. He realized that the remnants of the old Politburo would simply not allow him to carry out radical economic reforms. He decided to pursue political modernization first, and only then take up the economy. And he lost. Political modernization plunged the country into such chaos that nobody cared about economic reforms. And without them, the USSR was doomed. 
The main problem of the USSR in the early 80s is their dependence on oil. You heard me right, I'm not talking about modern Russia, where the ruble exchange rate is strictly tied to the price of oil, but about the mighty Soviet Union. In fact, I don't even know if I should consider this the biggest problem, because it helped to hide another problem, the fact that the USSR had to spend its gold reserve to buy grain for its people. Yes, the largest country in the world with its vast territories could not properly feed its population. But more about it later. Fortunately, the development of a Samatlor oil field began in 1970 and helped the Soviet Union survive for another 20 years by selling oil abroad. Or maybe it just prolonged the agony, you can take your pick. Thanks to the West Siberian project, the country became a world energy leader. And if at a price of 60 to 100 dollars per barrel it wasn't so bad, then as soon as the price went down, the USSR began to have big problems. During those rather rich years, the Soviet political leadership had developed a strong perception that now the most acute economic and social problems could be solved not by improving the efficiency of the economic system, but simply by increasing revenues from oil and gas exports. In fact, all the foreign trade of the USSR in those years can be described by the formula – oil in exchange for food and consumer goods. Well, probably this is normal for a country where there is nothing much but oil. But for a global superpower? And when the revenues plummeted, it turned out that there was nothing else to close the holes in the budget. All this coincided with the rapid reforms, accumulated people's frustration, and the Soviet Union could not withstand it. So why did the USSR have to sell oil and buy grain and meat for its people? In 1980, the Soviet Union ranked first in Europe and second in the world in terms of industrial production and agricultural holdings. One would think, how could such a country have problems with any goods? But if in 1972.2 million tons of grain was imported, then in 1975 it was already 15.9 million tons. By 1980 the purchase of grain rose to 27.8 million tons. And another 5 years later it was 44.2 million tons. In 15 years, a 20-fold increase. The situation with meat was even worse. In some cities people did not see meat for months. Slowly but surely the food shortage was acquiring threatening proportions. All this was due to the inefficient work of the agricultural system. Khrushchev threw huge amounts of money into the development of new agricultural lands, the development of Tselina. And then it turned out that this development was monstrously unprofitable. The grain problem could have been solved, but the reforms were necessary. And why do we need reforms if we have oil? The most annoying thing was that while purchasing food and consumer goods for petrodollars, the Soviet leadership made almost no use of oil and gas revenues for the large-scale modernization of agriculture and industry. Strategic planning? Nah. Again, it is worth mentioning that quality goods existed in the USSR. It was hard to buy them, but we will talk about that in the next section. In addition, the quality differed from product to product. Ice cream in the USSR was amazing. Everything else, that's where we have problems. Such big problems that, for example, clothes and shoes from any country of the former socialist camp, Poland is Germany, Czechoslovakia, were considered an elite commodity and there was a full-fledged hunt for them. A centrally planned economy is again a beautiful thing. The state tells the enterprises how many goods to produce and the enterprises carry out this plan. If everything is calculated correctly, it would seem that there are no problems, right? Not really. Human nature just doesn't work like that. Soviet Union offered its people the opportunity to work. They worked. The Soviet Union was capable of producing any significant industrial product that existed at that time. But the Soviet Union did not offer its people a single reason to work good. Enterprises had no motivation to make high-quality goods. Why try if your products still will be bought in the volume that is planned and at a predetermined price? Why come up with something new if citizens can walk around in the same clothes they were designed 20 years ago, work at a factory just as they did 20 years ago and eat the same canned spreads that they had 20 years ago? Maybe it could have worked. Maybe. If those spreads had at least been on the store shelves all the time. But there was another problem. As I said, it would have been alright if people could at least steadily buy these low-quality goods, but this was not always possible. Of course, people who lived in Moscow, Leningrad, the capitals of other Soviet republics or closed cities would argue with me. They'll say that there actually were no shortages here. 
But for 90% of people in the USSR, this was a reality. You come to the store in the morning, you go in and there's pretty much nothing. You can't buy anything. You have the money, yes, but you can't buy anything you need just because the store is empty. Empty shelves everywhere. Why is that? It's all the same reason. Manufacturers and the trade system on the planned economy were not interested in quality service, timely delivery, attractive design and maintaining high quality goods. You know, in my childhood I often heard an anecdote. What is it? Long, green and smells like sausage. It's a train from Moscow to Tver. People actually went to Moscow on weekends, spent 3 hours one way, one additional hour standing in the line at the store and all of this just to buy a couple of sticks of sausage and some meat. Fruits? People in Novosibirsk saw tangerines once a year and bananas were some kind of semi-mythical exotic. And I'm not even talking about the fact that many products simply did not reach the store shelves. If a good product came in the store, the store managers often simply kept it for their friends and relatives, rather than displayed it. Ordinary people got nothing. All the successes of the Soviet Union look slightly less impressive against this background. The USSR spent huge amounts of money on military defense. Huge. Now add the spending on space exploration, which was in fact the same spending on military defense. And I can't blame them for that. The Cold War was still a war, and war means spending. Imagine your country being at war for almost 40 years. It's a miracle that the economy of the Soviet Union had survived for those 40 years at all. Again, I don't blame the USSR for that. If your opponent forces an arms race, you have to accept their terms. Otherwise, the Cold War could turn into a hot war. The share of the budget that was spent on defense itself by many estimates was about 15-18%, to 18%, and this is not that excessive. But how was this money spent? For example, in the 1970s the USSR produced 20 times as many tanks as the US. Did they really need thousands of tanks? Probably not. But the military factories were already built and they had a plan. They needed something to keep them busy. So they had to produce useless tanks instead of modernizing the production facilities for more modern tasks. There is a well-known saying of David Holloway, who said, the Soviet Union does not have a military industrial complex. It is one itself. Of course, this is an exaggeration. But there is some truth to it. The Soviet Union was too busy chasing the number of tanks and forgot that it was necessary to evolve somehow. You know, maybe I'm biased. I'm a researcher after all. But the gap with the Western countries in those areas was simply catastrophic. It would seem that with the scientific and technological revolution going on, we should have radically reoriented imports and should have invested in modern equipment and technology. But nothing of the kind happened. For example, in 1990, the share of military research projects formally accounted for 79% of all innovative research projects of the USSR. According to some estimates, three quarters of scientists and technologists were working in military and paramilitary industries. That is, if the USSR invented anything, it was only for the military. There were no new ideas in civilian science. More precisely, they existed, but no one was going to finance them. According to the number of publications in scientific journals, Soviet scientists in 1981 to 1985 were in fourth place in the world after the United States, Britain and West Germany. So the ideas were there, but no one was in a hurry to implement them. Electronics, cybernetics, robotics and biotechnology should have been the first to be developed, but instead USSR was building tanks. This was especially evident in the trendiest field, the creation of computers. The Soviet computers were 10 years behind the global level, and this gap was only widening. And this was understood in the mid-60s. Here's an excerpt from a letter of Anatoly Kitov to Brezhnev, 1967. Not only is our lagging behind the United States and other capitalist countries not decreasing, but it is increasing rapidly. There are now about 30,000 computers in the United States, highly reliable, equipped with the necessary external devices and an advanced system of mathematical support. We just have around 1,000, including obsolete, low-performance machines. Computer technology for a very long time was not considered a key element of progress by the state. It was believed that this industry, although important, did not have an independent value. First of all, the Soviet Union needed computers to control nuclear missiles and the missile defense. Are they managing? Are they just as good as the computers of the US military? Well, alright, that's enough. But there was a disparity in civilian applications of computer technology from the beginning. And when this computer technology became vital to maintain the normal life of the country, 
the USSR simply could not respond to the challenge. This point in itself could be made in the separate video. Century-old elders like Brezhnev, Andropov and Chernenko led all of this. They were no longer able or willing to change, and they needed young people with new ideas very badly. Just think about it. Mikhail Gorbachev was the youngest member of the Politburo. At the time of his election he was 55 years old and was considered extremely young and progressive. So why wasn't there an influx of young talent? Why weren't there people who could gradually rejuvenate the backbone of the government, bring in new ideas and allow the Soviet state to develop? Well, maybe because the Soviet Union spent 20 years before that suppressing any manifestation of free will of anyone who even slightly disagreed with the official stance of the CPSU. The fight against dissent in the USSR reached such a scale that many of the most talented, intelligent and capable people in the country spent all their time and energy on anti-Soviet propaganda or on attempts to leave the country. These were the very people who could, with their minds and abilities, move the country forward and find a way out of the crisis. Instead, they were forced to leave. The country did not need bright and strong individuals. The country needed a faceless grey mass, and the USSR did everything to equalize its citizens and achieve their maximum depersonalization. Unfortunately, we don't live in a science fiction novel, and a state made of soulless robots is not able to function properly. And the Soviet Union was striving for exactly this kind of state. This can be considered both cause and effect. But since the early 1970s, society in the Soviet Union simply stopped developing. The USSR paid a lot of attention to the cultural aspect of the development of society. And in the first decades of its existence, it really did a lot for this by introducing ordinary people to theatre, cinema and literature. But then it simply stopped working. Most Soviet republics stopped believing in the victory of the world international and just wanted to live separately from the all-seeing eye of their big brother. In the 1970s, rates of alcohol consumption, suicide, crime including violent crime, simultaneously increased in the Soviet Union. Hazing and bullying became normal in the army. The number of terrorist attacks also grew, including terrorist attacks which were committed simply to flee the country. Can you imagine a country where people are willing to commit terrible crimes just to have a microscopic chance to escape? I can. The country is called North Korea. People just stopped believing in the bright future of communism. They saw their country spending huge amounts of money on aid to Africa, on the war in Afghanistan, on desperate attempts to beat the US in everything, on keeping the Warsaw Pact countries at bay, on sending dozens more rockets into space. And at the same time, the country had no desire to spend money on their citizens. And citizens stopped wanting to live in this country. Remember that the Soviet Union was the country of the Soviets, the country of people. And if the people stopped believing in such country, the country ceases to exist.